Hi everyone. Um, so it's thank you for signing in. We have a really exciting event planned here. Um, so we are going to be um, having uh, several short presentations, um, and then we're going to be doing a question and answer at the end. Uh, so the way that we're going to be doing the questions, um, please write your questions into the chat, and I will be collecting them um, and asking them at the end of the of our presentations. Um, so our first presenter is going to be, I'm going to just introduce each, each speaker before they speak. Um, our first uh, speaker is Julian Dirkus from the University of uh, British Columbia. I guess that's my that's my cue yeah. to start speaking. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> speaking into the silence. Well, um, hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's going on midnight for Marissa and I on the West Coast in North America. Um, various time zones and various states of uh, awakeness. Uh, there's probably some coffees uh, on some of those images I see. Um, uh, what a great, I mean, uh, w what a crazy year, but what a nice thing that we're discovering means to talk to each other uh, that existed last year, but we just didn't use. So um, this is wonderful. And, and many thanks for, to uh, Nanatsok and to Marissa for putting the series together. Uh, what, a, what a great use uh, of, of the ACMS as sort of a hub of research on Mongolia. Uh, and what a nice way for all of us to come together. Um, it's one of the things I really like about Zoom is that at least it says your name uh, with your, even if you have your camera turned off, I can see your name and it's wonderful to see some very familiar names. Um, there'll be some new names as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the questions. Um, I've got um, a short presentation to just, um, and it's, uh, yeah, um, just to get things rolling. Uh, so let me just, um, get the screen share going here and get that set up. Uh, and hopefully now you can see a PowerPoint uh, that says the virtue of imperfect political decisions. And I see some nods, so hopefully that's working. So um, uh, what I wanna talk about uh, just very briefly uh, is um, the lack of um, an ideology to Mongolian politics, if you will, or the lack of, of cleavages between parties. And I find that noticeable. And it's been something that I've been thinking about for some time, um, because there are really significant challenges that contemporary Mongolia faces um, that are begging for political answers. Uh, and they're contested answers. Um, yet, uh, political parties, at least, and politicians themselves, are not dividing along at least foreseeable or recognizable lines on some of these cleavages um, that, that might exist. And we saw this once again in the election in June, where um, obviously there was a bit of excitement around some of the new candidates, not just with the new parties, but also with the existing parties um, and a fair number of new candidates voted in. Um, nevertheless, uh, as had been the case in previous elections, uh, it remained relatively difficult to actually distinguish the parties in terms of uh, some thematic orientation to the policies that they're proposing. Um, and I think even though, so as a, as a sort of a, an observation then, even though I find uh, democracy to be set up and institutionalized relatively well, uh, I'm not entirely sure that Mongolian voters actually do get to determine the fate of the country in a significant way. Um, and just wanted to share some observations around that as a theme. So this is, um, I wanna emphasize that this isn't really based on a specific targeted um, research uh, program or agenda, but it's really just uh, observations over the past 15 years that have included my visits to Mongolia during the last, all the last national elections, although of course the, the last one had to be virtual. Um, and lots of conversations around polit political topics along the way, um, and a, a number of projects that had me engaged with uh, certainly the two major parties, um, but with other uh, aspiring or, or active politicians as well. And so this is this is really just a something that's been um, stirring in me and and bubbling. And so I'm just sharing some broader observations around this rather than specific findings or so. And let me start with a little bit of a more of an abstract starting point. And I'm not a, I'm a sociologist, not a, um, 
uh, a political scientist nor a political theorist. So this is just sort of a, a, lays, a lay person's uh, view of democracy, right? But what in the very most abstract sense, elements of democracy that are very important, not, not necessarily sufficient, or, um, but they're very important to it, are popular participation on the one hand and political freedoms. And, and then we add to that when we look at a representative democracy, um, which Mongolia in many ways is, and it's one that has generated parties, that parties have been active in, obviously, then we still think of the people as a sovereign delegating power and decisions to their representatives, that's to parliament. Um, but we also sort of expect that parties generate platforms, policy platforms, that give voters a real sense of the decisions they're going to make. And so they, they provide voters the chance to predict future decisions in some ways, right? When I look at a, as a voter, when I look at a party platform, what I'm personally looking for is a sense of, oh, so if something new happens two years from now, what am I expecting the people that I might vote for, how might they decide? Um, and, and I want that predictability because I generally, I have preferences and political values that would make me want to decide in a certain way. And so I'm looking for those to be reflected in a party. And, and so that's what I'm expecting in a, in a representative party democracy in many ways. But what we see in Mongolia and what I observe is, is first this very strong equation of um, thinking about democracy primarily in freedom terms. And this is what Paula Sadlov's work, um, political anthropologist Paula Sadlov's work was on and a, a lot of her extensive interviews that by now, um, I think most of those interviews were there in the early 2000s, but I find that to largely still hold that in conversations with Mongolians, there's this very strong sense of that what democracy means is freedom. Um, rather than, as I mentioned in a previous slide, the opportunity for voters to determine on the direction, the future direction the country takes. Um, so there's this, that first piece. Then there's a second piece uh, that I keep bumping into that elevates pragmatism to sort of a political principle. Um, and this is something that we see in, in lots of other democracies. It's not unusual. Uh, the best example um, uh, for me is, is always Japan, in part because a lot of my research, my earlier research is focused on Japan. But that largely that's what we see in Japan, right? That, that there's a sense that um, politicians and governments uh, make decisions when they face particular situations and make a pragmatic decision in that moment and try to pursue it. And we see a lot of that in the Mongolian context that um, that, and it's not exactly the opposite of a party platform or a thematic or an ideological platform, um, but it elevates the sense of, well, um, when we face that decision, we're just going to try to make a good decision um, at that moment to a political principle. And then there's this other piece um, that I keep also running into, which is that there's a very strong expectation uh, that I see in Mongolia from voters as much as from policymakers and also to some extent from analysts, there's an expectation that for most political challenges, there's a single best solution. And that somehow that single best solution is knowable. So when governments face challenges, whether that's a pandemic or decisions about, I don't know, pensions or schools or whatever else, that somewhere out there in the world, there actually is a best solution to that challenge. Um, and it, it seems to be a, a strong belief that, that many Mongolians hold that if you just look far enough and ask around far enough um, and have the right methodologies, you will somehow arrive at the perfect answer uh, to challenges. Now, where I've seen this particularly in field work, um, and, I'm, and there's a couple of examples that I would point to here and a couple of observations. So as I mentioned earlier on, one of the things I've been doing over the last several years, part, uh, largely in collaboration with the Friedrich Hebert Foundation in Mongolia and their partnership uh, with, uh, with the Mongolian People's Party and their youth organization, is we've, we've run some workshops um, with countryside um, youth activists in the party around policymaking. And one of the things we do in those um, uh, our simulation exercises, which are really, um, really fun and interesting to do, but we, we sort of uh, set up an exercise where participants choose uh, what party to represent and, and for what party to develop a platform. The most popular choice in ev almost inevitably is what people then call the national party. Um, and when we ask them to develop a platform for that party, um, 
they often describe it as the party that does the right thing for the nation. Now, my understanding of democracy is that every party wants to do the right thing for the nation. That's why people get into politics. Uh, that's the whole purpose of having particular democratic politics, but really politics otherwise. It's, it's that there's a difference of opinion and values about what the right thing is, which makes, which sort of enlivens democracy and creates debate. But there's a sense, and it goes along with what I said earlier about the sense for a, a one, a, a, a single perfect right solution. There's the sense that if only there was a party that did the right thing for the nation, then that would be the best way to go. And it sometimes meshes with calls for de technocratic governments. We've seen this over the last several um, cabinets where, and we obviously see it now with a constitutional amendment where where um, the WD, the uh, members of parliament and cabinet are limited to four, um, where there's been a push to appoint ministers who are subject matter experts. And I think it goes along, uh, or it has its roots in this perception of a single right decision, right? These are, these are sort of instances where I see that. Then when we look at the last election and, and some of the enthusiasm that was generated early on around some of the new party candidates, particularly the Hun, the National Labour Party, um, there, the, the, some of the enthusiasm, I think at least, was primarily about change. Uh, and it wasn't entirely clear what direction that change would take. Um, yes, uh, Hun has, has a platform and there's certain things in it, but it, it doesn't quite, in my reading at least, it doesn't quite amount to a political theme yet. Um, that is, beyond the things that they've specified in their program, I would have a relatively hard time predicting what decisions a Hun government might make, just as much as I would for an MPP or for a DP government. And so I see the same sort of theme continuing in many ways there. And then it's something that, that um, I confront all the time when I, when I act as a, as a quasi-consultant, um, and when many participants, for example, in workshops um, ask or request a solution to challenges. Um, and I just don't quite, that's always puzzling because I don't feel like I have solutions. I have ways to, I, I can sometimes say what past bad examples have been, but good examples there are many of, and there's never the best example. And that notion of best practice, I find rather puzzling as well. And so this is another place where I think the sense of it, there's one single right solution in, in political contestation uh, bubbles up again. So if we look at how that plays out, and I've just kind of picked two examples in part because they're such important political challenges. Um, but one of the things that's puzzled me for many, many years now about Mongolia is that there are, there's no party mobilization around mining. There is no anti-mining party really, at least not one that's politically viable in the sense that might get elected. And there's no pro-mining party really. Um, and, and in a country where so much of the economic development and spilling on the social development and everything else depends on the extractive industry, uh, for better or for worse, obviously, um, that's puzzling that there is no that there's no party cleavage around this and there are no party stances that are that are consistent that I find to be particularly consistent. Um, and we see it even more in a in a specific topic like the question of whether the Oyotoga investment agreement is good or not. Um, that question itself is again based on this assumption that there's a perfect solution to problems. Um, and, and I would say there just isn't, there's no standard by which we can actually judge the investment agreement to be particularly good or bad. There's aspects we could point to, but we don't really have a, you know, there's no way to plug that into the formula and say in the end, yeah, good agreement or not, right? It's really whether it works or not. And it's that investment agreement, just like much of, of democratic policy, politics is about the art of compromise, right? And finding out whether it's a workable compromise. And so I see some of these principles play out very much in the, uh, around mining and mining governance. And likewise around corruption, where I think certainly in the last several elections, we've had a strong sense from voters that there's, um, there are a lot of fears, that there's a lot of resentment around the corruption and that tends to get turned into a drive to replace people. But replacing people is not a political stance, right? Because the, there certainly can be a hope that some of the new people who've been elected will be less corrupt, but there's no reason to assume that they will be. Um, unless 
what I, or what I would think would be a political movement around corruption would be one that would actually advocate and, and engage in debates about what possible fixes there are, what institutions might be changed, how enforcement might be changed, rather than simply saying, let's, let's exchange some of the people here. And so I'm just using these as two examples to illustrate this principle that I see. And then finally, just to say a little bit what this means, right? Um, I think if, if this expectation continues, um, that it's a reasonable question to ask whether democracy is best at producing solutions to challenges, then that is a very hard uh, question to ask of democracy. And because I don't actually think democracy is the best at producing solutions. It's, it provides the best way to search for solutions, but it doesn't always, certainly not in the short term, provide the best solutions in part because it's built around compromise. Uh, democracy always is, and that's one of its great strengths. And so if that expectation continues um, or grows in the Mongolian electorate, that democracy should always be producing the best solutions, then that will be disappointed and that spells some risk uh, to democracy itself. If on the other hand, we see at some point, um, some of this recent enthusiasm we've seen translate into a different kind of a party landscape that is built more around political cleavages, then I would certainly say that all the elements for, for a continued democratic path uh, are in place and, 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 uh, and really have uh, give me great confidence, I think, in Mongolian democracy. And so there you go, um, some thoughts about politics and about democracy. Um, and I look forward to hearing what Sanjay and what Judith have to say and all the questions that Marissa channels from all of you. Great, thanks very much, Julian. Um, next, we're gonna be hearing from um, Sancher Jarosaikan. Um, and Sancher and I know each other from uh, 2018. We were both visiting scholars at the University College London um, for a project uh, run by Dr. Rebecca Emson um, about uh, Mongolia as an emerging economy, but we were also grappling with Mongolia's um, bust, uh, the mining bust, so, um, and, uh, Sancher is an activist and political scientist who's looking at Mongolia as um, also in relation to Central Asia and to the global south. So uh, without further ado, I will pass it on to Sancher. Hello guys. So I guess I need to share the screen, right? Mm -hmm. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Looks good. Uh, good. So um, when we were discussing our topics, uh, Julian proposed that why don't we talk about ideology or lack of ideology in Mongolia or in contemporary Mongolian politics. So I was, I was also thinking about it because uh, of my current work about mining and environment and its governance in Mongolia and how different big economic or social interests are not represented or not even aggregated at the political arena or even picked up during discussions. So um, when thinking about not politics, not only in Mongolia, but for the last 30 years, I was thinking about this quote from Antonio Gramsci about his discussion of interwars in Europe where the crisis uh, consists not the, of, uh, of the fact that the old is dying or the new cannot be born, but the in-between part <laughs> where the trans whether the so-called transition or transformation is happening. And it seems like the politics and everything connected with this is stuck in this time frame of transition or transformation. So, Thinking about ideology, uh, maybe Mark Fisher's quote about ideology could be mo the most pertinent in, this, in describing the political climate in Mongolia right now. So his quote about capitalist ideology that is not supposed to be explicit, but as propaganda during Soviet times or even in Nazi Germany, but in, a, in this all encompassing everyday reproduction of systems and attitudes of people that it's not explicit but it's concealed under 
institutions, uh, rules of the game, etc., could be uh, considered as an ideology or as everyday happenstances. So, in other words, capitalism in current incarnation in Mongolia can function perfectly without anyone making a, an explicit case for it. That is my <laughs> uh, quote to introduce my argument for today. So, in that sense, ideology for me doesn't have to be uh, specifically tied to any social political position in the political spectrum of different parties or even an explicit um, expression of different ideologies uh, in the popular culture or discourses in social media etc so even in, in maybe in a Zizekian terms, an ideology could be described as even absence of ideology. Ironical distance from anything concerned with ideology can be constructed as an ideology. So when Julian was talking about why there is an absence of um, explicit vested interests and its aggregation in the political um, idea, arena and in term, especially during elections. I was thinking about the, about the transition from socialism to capitalism in Mongolia and how the current political mobilization in Donetsk, Mongolia. So in that sense, uh, the structural and functional forms of political parties and its current incarnations in Mongolia seems not uh, as opposed to our beliefs, it's not really um, based on mobilization of different classes, such as working classes or artisans or any other big business classes in Mongolia. So in that sense, political mobilization in Mongolia seems it's done through heterogeneous networks of feedback processes where very many different actors play on and leverage political parties to gain whatever they want to gain from political positions or positions in state sectors, etc. So in that sense, uh, my main point is mobilization is not done through large economic interests or mobilization of classes, but it's done through different interests in economic factions that criss crisscross parties both polit big political parties as well as many other different smaller political parties. So what are those that are those actors that hop and off of the, of, um, between those parties? They consist of different um, people, entrepreneurial type of middlemen, uh, previous NPRP apparatchiks that have lost their, much of their political capital during 1990s and during transition areas. So in that sense, uh, the large-scale mobilization takes backseat to more patrimonial as well as other type of networks in Mongolia. So that's why when you see more than 30 different political parties and none of them have any defined constituencies, such as labor unions or even mining interests, as Julian mentioned in his um, uh, previous presentation, uh, nor it's, it's based on any class uh, interests or anything in between. So in that sense, it's pretty exemplary, but not ex ex uh, exceptional. If you look at post-social politics and the, the so-called post-social varieties of capitalism in Central Asia, and even in some Eastern European countries. So Mongolia's case is very similar to many Central Asian states where the, this, the, the during the transition time, even in the immediate aftermath of the transition, we didn't have our you know, uh, capitalist class or even Western style civil society before it, introduction of communism, which didn't even grow uh, during the communist era. So this is uh, more of a version of notion of capitalism without capitalists that describes transition from communism to capitalism. So uh, I'm arguing that it can be more aptly termed as capitalist without capitalism in Mongolia. So if I, if I have some time, I can elaborate that on lately. So in that sense, uh, if you look at political parties in Mongolia, then they can be a microcosm of Mongolian sociopolitical situation. 
So in that sense, political parties do not operate in their classical sense that described is described in political science textbooks, etc. In Mongolia, it operates in very many different forms and shapes and functions. So in that sense, uh, political scientists Sergei Vachenko and Jaga Sechan describe it as more of, of a, they are having a dual mandate of where political parties operate as advocacy networks as well as mobilization groupdoms, resembling certain fiefdoms during medieval times or even resembling some of functions of medieval guilds during the Europe, where the political party functions as a benefactor to their only own to their own constituents rather than the general populace and because it connects to the lack of class base of politics. So in that sense, it's also political parties in certain senses um, have a function of even of not only social mobilization, but in terms of, but also of social guarantee and social protection in certain senses. So for example, when I was doing field work in many different uh, provinces, especially where mining operations are frequent, the, there is uh, uh, lots of songs and bugs where there is uh, lots of poverty and lack of uh, any life-sustaining services, jobs and opportunities. So in that sense, patronage networks that are in some sense overlap at the, uh, with local politics become an important lifeline. So that's why there is uh, such a heterogeneous constituency of both at many levels that constitute these political parties. So in that sense, these political rural political parties and the overlapping constituent and patronage networks also connect particular regional interests to political center where everything happens to in, with the lamb butter. So in that sense, these patronage networks that sometimes overlap with political parties operate as vertical and horizontal social networks to counter poverty and inequality of resources in different communities. So for example, one very, very important case that illustrates my argument is that if you look, if you, even if you look at uh, the MPP is more of a clear example of this because of the vast networks of MPP and their connections at the grassroots level, most some social protection uh, policies such as child money, in, uh, acquire this wide ranging um, utilization because they are able to infiltrate through all those patronage networks at the local level. So in that sense, some even poorly designed social protection measures end up being as models even during. So that's why th this is one of the factors that, uh, un uh, that underlie behind the fact that Mongolia social protection programs such as child money or even Mm, food coupons, etc., uh, are loaded by organizations such as UNDP as one of the one of the most foremost and progressive round in the region. So, coming back to ideology, in that uh, ideology, in a sense, operates in Mongolia not on, on a classical political platform where the left and right are designated with center and there is a very clear delineation of which fractions op operate and constitute which parties. So in that sense, our ideology is more of an ingrained uh, and heterogeneous and multi-level and scalar um, phenomena in Mongolian politics. Our ideolo ideology also functions not, not only in terms of political party and official politics, but it also functions as discursive methods as well as discursive weapons and tools to legitimate current regime or to delegitimate de de current regimes, to make sense of everyday uh, happens, to make sense of our Mongolian democracy, to make sense of our Mongolian identity. And there are so many more interconnected uh, functions of ideology. So just few uh, uh, this black and white conceptualizations that Mongolians try to make sense of themselves and make sense of their positioning in the world in terms of their national identity, personal and group identity. Uh, ident uh, ideology operates on the discursive terms where democracy is conceptualized against authoritarianism, 
democracy is taken up as one of the fundamentals of modern Mongolia and its fundamentals of Mongolian identity. Parliamentary democracy versus presidency, meritocracy versus nepotism, and wealth creators, so-called, so so which happens to be mostly mining business, businessmen and women that are artificially juxtaposed against other people, public servants, and the general populace. The transition from democracy, to, uh, from communism to democracy, or even transformation, uh, how to make sense of that, uh, how to take up populism, how to identify populism, etc. So in that sense, uh, ideology operates uh, in such an heterogeneous and multiscalar ways that it's such a food for thought for future and current political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists to look at not uh, Mongolian formal politics, but uh, to the, uh, it highlights the need to look at more informal politics, everyday people's negotiations of their identities and etc. So I will probably have more chance to extrapolate my points further if there is a chance during the Q&A session. So this is my five cents. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Sanchir. Um, yeah, I also um, wanted to, now that we've had two of you go, um, it would make sense too if, uh, if Julian or Judith, did you want to respond to Sanchir's talk or? I'm happy At to this time, wait, or? let you... Judith go okay. next and then we'll go after that. When we'll all do it together. Okay, Yeah. sounds good. Um, okay, the last panel, the last uh, event, we had two speakers, so it made a bit more sense to kind of do that in between. Um, okay, yeah, well, let's uh, go on to um, Dr. Judith Nordby. Um, Dr. Nordby uh, is the former head of Mongolian studies and is now honorary fellow in Mongolian studies at the University of Leeds in England. Um, and she is still uh, actively engaged in working on Mongolian history and contemporary affairs as well, um, and still engaged in consulting work. Um, so, thank you, Judith. On to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes, good, good. Uh, I, I found, I found Sanchez's uh, talk very, very interesting because it, it, did, um, it, it did touch on the question of the legacy of the socialist period. Uh, I'm essentially a historian, not a, not a political scientist. And uh, this is this is the approach that I've I've, I've made to to this um, question of Mongolian politics. Uh, I'm I, I've been asking myself three questions: uh, what is what is politics like? Uh, why is it like it is? And what are the prospects for the future? Uh, I think what I'm going to say is probably rather general, but provides will perhaps provide a useful context for the uh, for the discussion session. Um, Mongolia had no prior experience of the multi-party system before 1990. Uh, in the socialist period, the ruling party regulated, controlled and ran everything. Decisions were top-down and declared the only correct way to do things. Ordinary people had uh, rather a small input into those decisions and were constantly encouraged to follow the party's wise advice. Now, to accept ideas you were once taught were wrong and to rapidly adopt new ways of working and relationships <clears throat> uh, are uh, a lot to ask of any, any society. Uh, however, uh, Mongolian people were encouraged by the idea of a new great leap forward uh, and promises of a better standard of living. However, the national, the national leaders uh, faced great demands and great challenges in the early 1990s. They had to cope with working with people who held a range of different views and opinions. Um, ordinary people uh, who were now taking advantage of the freedoms of speech and assembly. And adjustment to the rules of uh, globalized economic and democratic principles. Furthermore, they had to learn and understand a whole new political vocabulary, uh, which I think is an important uh, question for, Mong for Mongolists to, uh, to address, uh, although I won't say anything about it here. So how did the political forces uh, negotiate their way through these challenges 
and uh, how successful have they been? Politics has become very confrontational. Uh, in what is essentially a two-party system, consensus and compromise was and is difficult. There have been occasional fights in Parliament. Uh, there are rumours and accusations of immorality, abuse of power, and not being a genuine Mongol. And this can result in uh, legal action in the local and in the con con constitutional courts. There's been a great deal of use made of the, of the, courts, of the court system for, for these reasons. Uh, boycotts and threats to boycotts of bo boycotts to parliaments are not uncommon. Uh, now, coalitions are regular features of elections, but as a means of ruling the country, they've not worked well. They delay the process of parliamentary business and lead to confrontation and changes of government, which in turn result in the, in the sacking of many state and public servants. Uh, they also um, damage confidence, uh, the confidence of the electorate in their, in their uh, leaders. Uh, however, while politics have been uh, heavily dominated by men, in recent years, the small number of female MPs have begun to work together to, uh, to cooperate as uh, a multi-party group in, uh, in Parliament. But there's confrontation not only between parties, but also within parties. Uh, over the past 30 years, the two main uh, parliamentary parties, the Mongolian Pe People's Party and the DP, as they're now called, the Democratic Party, have experienced splits and mergers, name changes, and the formation of subgroups or factions. Uh, when, when such things happen, uh, loyalty to personalities can be as important uh, as, uh, or even more important than differences over policy or ideology. It's been very hard to reach con consensus on certain issues, such as whether Mongolia should have a parliamentary or a presidential system, who should have the larger share of ownership in large mining joint ventures, um, and we, we, could go, we could go on there with many examples. Um, these questions come around regularly, both in and outside Parliament, and I'm quite sure that they're going to come around again, in spite of, in spite of solutions that have, been, that have been reached. Politicians and uh, citizens will continue to argue from positions of morality, uh, what is economically beneficial or dangerous, and what may or may not be genuinely Mongol. The appeal to historical precedence and tradition can be extremely powerful. So how does the voting public respond to national politics? From the 1960s, um, <clears throat> interest groups uh, have formed to lobby politicians and to organize demonstrations over wages, employment, uh, environment, for example. Uh, activism has developed uh, considerably since the 1990s. The protests occasionally turn violent when the police intervene. Hunger strikes are a popular tactic. And like the politicians, ordinary citizens uh, are making much use of the media. Sometimes they're successful in pushing their concerns at the uh, public agenda and sometimes manage to get a pay rise. The media are a particular problem, I think, for the government, for all governments. Although the press is officially free and the state broadcasting has become a public service, uh, the authorities have been wary about the unchecked circulation of information. Uh, they, they do seem to like, uh, like secrecy. Since the 1990s, uh, journalists have been expressing concern about attempts to control what can be printed and some have been jailed or even fined them, or fined under the defamation laws. Uh, one, there, there was one case uh, very recently. Uh, so a free press and uh, media uh, uh, is, also, is also an aspect of the post-1990 order in which Mongolian leaders are still not, not, com not comfortable. And I think this is probably true of, uh, of all sides of the political spectrum. Both politicians and the people crave order, stability and unity. And my feeling is that the, two, the 2020 election results do reflect this. 
um, while, while these are not things that uh, that are the only reason for the uh, for the recent MPP victory, uh, I think uh, I think they are important. Coalitions have not worked in Mongolia, as I said earlier. A majority government, and one that remains in power for uh, for a full term, uh, very few of them have, uh, has generally had uh, had a better chance of delivering at least some of what uh, of what it promises. Uh, just as long as its own internal divisions don't block the business of parliament. Uh, greater state control may be the price. Mongolians will pay to see the development and improvements in living standards that they that they want. Um, however, any party in power will have to have to deal with the pressing issues such as poverty, job creation, and economic uh, diversification if it wants to wants to stay in in power. And that's not going to be easy because Mongolia is signed up to so many international conventions and and uh, and uh, commercial and other kinds of agreements. Uh, ultimately, I think calls for unity, which we hear pre uh, frequently, are not going to are not going to be enough. So it leaves a lot of questions open. I think. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, yeah. So as, as I was saying, I would I would like to actually give uh, uh, Julian, Sancho, and Judith. I would like to give you guys a chance to to respond to one another before we do the question and answer from the from our our audience here. Maybe uh, Julian can go first since he was. I've had the longest time to listen because I went first. Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. Well, thank, excellent. Uh, well, thanks, Sanjay and, and Judith. Um, uh, the, the, without coordinating, we I think we've really uh, we've really talked about similar things, which is terrific. I hope the audience um, feels the same way. Um, I, I guess um, I I think less about capitalism than you do, Sanjay, as a as a big ideological cleavage. Um, and I, I suppose that's because I, I, it just seems, uh, right, for me, a lot of the thinking about party democracy is, it comes from uh, on, basically on a background of, uh, of thinking about European political systems, uh, where capitalism has been such an important force in shaping political systems over the past, say, 150 years or so. And, 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 um, inspiring uh, and delineating exactly the cleavages that I don't see in Mongolia. But um, um, without proclaiming the end of history, I would just say since 1990, I'm just not entirely sure that capitalism still is the source for political cleavages that it was 100 years earlier. And so I, I my, to the extent that I, that I am surprised not to see more cleavages uh, along ideological lines or political lines in Mongolia, I'm I'm not so surprised that, that it's not around capitalism. I, I'm I'm looking for, uh, I I would have in mind more cleavage around the the contrast, for example, between um, uh, between uh, people living in the countryside and the city, for example. Um, yeah, poverty and and uh, and the middle class or so. Well, that to me is a different kind of a cleavage than capitalism is. Uh, so just to pick up on that that capitalism piece in uh, what Sanjay has talked about, and then um, to respond a little bit to Judith is, um, um, well, you know, <laughs> I guess it's a British versus a German thing, right? To me, coalitions are wonderful, and you think they're terrible <laughs> and short, <laughs> and that's uh, that's Westminster democracy versus German democracy, I suppose. I I don't see the coalitions as problematic at all. What I, or actually, let me rephrase that in the. I find them problematic in the way that I've talked about in that they are not coalitions of ideologically different parties. They are co they're, they're sort of people coming together and, and Sanjay talked about patrimonialism and the like, and that's what holds these coalitions together. But it's not a, it's not a recognition of political difference, but coming together uh, in a moment to actually govern across those differences. And so, um, I, I think I, I, I look at the coalitions that we've seen um, a little bit differently uh, and, and don't think of them as, as, uh, as really particularly a hindrance to much other political developments in Mongolia. I'll leave it at that just to be a little bit shorter, but, um, but really enjoy both your presentations and uh, I'm, I'm hoping for more comments and questions. Sancher? Yeah. Um... Uh, to Julian's um, intervention, uh, 
Actually, apologies if I wasn't very clear, but my exact point was that capitalism or advanced uh, capitalist cleavages are not really applicable to Mongolia. So actually the opposite one, <laughs> my, my point was actually what you were making of it. And regarding coalitions, I have a very similar views where we, we cannot see coalitions as coalitions between parties because most of the times the unit of the analysis is not the party itself, but the intermingling factions, not with within parties and uh, within par with parties and inter parties. So in that sense, uh, the unit of the more, more interesting unit of analysis would be uh, the factions between them or even any coalescence of factions. So in that sense, uh, the very interesting part is that uh, in Mongolia, there has been uh, this uh, overarching debate about presidentialism and parliamentarism. So many political scientists have this consensus where the semi-presidential system with dual executive function of the president and the parliament is uh, formulated as a, as a break for Mongolian democracy as uh, and anything and the current and the recent amendments to the constitution was mostly trying to overcome that uh, d dilemma for Mongolians. But in, in history, there are no, we cannot know the counterfactuals, but in my view, the presidential system has acted as a very, very uh, important and balancing role throughout many, many governments where most, where many presidents from the Democratic Party were uh, elected by the general Mongolian populace uh, to be as a break and, and an opposition to the ruling Mongolian People's Party. So um, I, I'm really a bit, little bit skeptical about all of those people who say that a clear uh, parliamentary type of governance would be a panacea for every, any every eels in Mongolia. So that's pretty much it for this part. Judith, did you have any anything you wanted to, to respond? Uh, yes. Um, I can't really comment on uh, on uh, Julian's presentation because I had such difficulty in getting into the session, but here I am now, thankfully. Um, but uh, but to his to his response to my what I said about co coalitions, um, I, I, I'm not suggesting that they are they are essentially bad. Some some countries do do. Uh, deal with them quite well I think of think of Norway for instance um, but uh, but I do think I do think that they've been quite problematic in in uh, in Mongolia both for the for the uh, for the voting public uh, and also because uh, because they, uh, they they do essentially they do essentially uh, disrupt a lot of parliamentary business a lot of arguing goings on uh, obviously our, our arguing and discussion is important part of is important Part of uh, of, uh, of politics, but Mongolia is under pressure from uh, from uh, many uh, many international organisations that it has responsibilities to, uh, and uh, so it is it is quite difficult, I think, to. Um, you know, they're being pulled in a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of di directions uh, here. Uh, thinking just of just of the IMF for uh, for for instance, you know, if you don't do this this uh, within this time period, uh, we're going to cut mm. off your money, and then and then the um, uh, other other donors other donors that Mongolia is relying on uh, are saying uh, uh, are saying, oh, it doesn't look very good. Uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, hold we'll hold back on what on what we are likely to. Uh, likely to offer so uh, that's my that's my feeling about the situation around around co around uh, coalitions um, all I'm trying to do is really is really present uh, present the picture uh, uh, the picture of, uh, of uh, what, what the events are tell have been telling us over the past over the past 30 30 years um, I, I found Sanchez's uh, uh, presentation uh, very, uh, very interesting, uh, also, and I think I think his um, his comments on on, co on coalitions, in a sense, have uh, provided some expansion to to what I what I was uh, saying. 
So that, 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 that's all I have to I have to say at the moment. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, OK, just to get into the, the questions we've, we've gotten, um, I think uh, a lot of these questions were, were pretty well addressed um, by the by the, uh, the talks and your responses to one another. Um, so we had a number of people who were interested in, in the relationship between the People's Party and the, the DP, for instance, and I think that that was pretty well covered. Uh, one question um, that I think might be good is uh, there, there was um, a lot of, uh, there's a question about basically the issue of, our, of the numbers of, of members of parliament, is it enough? Um, and this person is also raising the issue of, of what's called in the U.S. at least gerrymandering. Um, is that something you think is 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 an issue? The the sort of number of representatives in Parliament. Um, but again, that gets to something that a thing that was coming up in your comments about the relationship of the president to the Parliament. Um, one thing I would like to just sort of interject to um is uh what is the what is the place of the mongolian court system right and there have also been recent talks about doing reforms um but you know in the at least the kind of american system of government there's a third <laughs> a third checks and balances in the mix and so i i often find myself having to explain to to americans as, a, as an expert on mongolian politics like what how does how does the mongolian court system fit in so um those are some questions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Judith, you yeah, raised your hand first. On the question of, uh, of the, are, there, are there enough MPs? Uh, I have always felt that this was an exceedingly small number um, and uh, people have said, oh well, Mongolia is just a, a, just a, yeah. a, a, a small country. A small and country. historically there, there were more, right? Because you had the two houses oh, of yes, parliament. Oh yes, but they didn't, they, they, they didn't really make any yeah. decisions. Did they? Right. Uh, they just they just rubber stamp the decisions that were passed down to them. But I I do feel that there's not enough people to do the work. And uh, frequently these days you see uh, you see decisions have been taken in Parliament, and uh, there's there's rarely there's rarely a full house a full house there. So we get you know 34 percent out of out of sixty two have agreed to this uh, to this resolution. Um, I, I do think I do think a few more MPs uh, might be might be uh, quite uh, might be quite useful. So I don't. I'll be straightforward. Uh, Seventy six is perfectly fine. Canada, with ten times the population of Mongolia, has about has just under uh, somewhere in the four hundreds um, MPs. Um, Germany, with uh, thirty times the population, has around eight hundred. Um, Seventy six is totally fine. Uh, and changing the number from 76 to 100 would make no difference whatsoever. Oh, definitely agree with Julian there. Uh, some hardcore political scientist would have a way to crunch some numbers and come up with the numbers. So, I, but I won't pretend to have any number there, but because it's just a quantitative side, but qualitatively, the better way to look at this situation would be uh, to look at the channels of representation, channels where different interest group can uh, leverage their position interests to the representative body. So that's where uh, comes the qualitative part, which is much more diff difficult to analyze. So uh, there was a study uh, done by Mongolian legal scholars, I think two years ago, so, for example, apparently there are 680 something uh, active laws that are ratified uh, in Mongolia and currently. And out of those 600 and something, nearly 700, about 200 something have some stipulations about public participation. So that's the formal side, right? But if you look at uh, how people and different interest group are utilizing and using those provisions, there is a just opposite uh, picture that are going on. So in that sense, uh, the quality of, the, of participation, of mobilizing, of political mobilization is probably just a better and more productive way to look at the representatives at all levels. 
And just to pick up on Marissa on your question about the legal system as well, right? I mean, this is, <clears throat> I think this is one of the big changes uh, for me in, in observing Mongolia in the last two or three years um, is that um, we're now beginning to think of Mongolia as a, as, as a captured state by corrupt interests, right? Um, in a way that, that I think I certainly hadn't anticipated five years ago or so. And ultimately, um, there has to be some reliance on the court system to combat that. Uh, I mean, it's nice to get anti-corruption candidates elected and it's nice to get new candidates elected who claim not to be corrupt, but ultimately you need some kind of an enforcement. And, and we've, unfortunately, um, the rule of law has been weak in that regard. And we, we see that at the moment with um, the whole slew of former officials who have now landed themselves in prison. Um, and, and I have nothing to say about their guilt or innocence individually, but just the fact that so many of them uh, are cur currently being um, successfully prosecuted uh, to me speaks of political motivations for those prosecutions. And that's obviously highly problematic for a democracy. Um, and so in this regard, I, I completely agree that that the judicial system is quite important and it's been a factor that has be become more important in Mongolia for its failure over the last several years, I think. Yep. Mm, just a quick intervention to be a devil's advocate on that issue. Mm. Uh, I think there is uh, also a saving grace and bright side to the, uh, those happenings where lots of people are being arrested. In, in certain senses, uh, in Mongolia, politics uh, have been becoming more and more enclosed in more technocratic language for, uh, for at least past 10 or something years. And different machinations, financial and otherwise, were being done constantly but nothing was being reprimanded. And there was just this overall frustration about of politics being so far apart, both in forms and languages from ordinary people, that some of it's being just like a longstanding disease is coming out in all its <laughs> uh, bad and bright and dark sides that it's, there is maybe a little bit of saving grace there that the encryption of politics, the so-called is being little, the bubble itself is being a little bit popped up. And when you see like people who were in charge of disastrous monetary policies during the 2012 and 15 eras that are being uh, savored as saviors and technocratic gods on Twitter this morning, and then being <laughs> not being accountable in any way, shape or form, and those bubble, uh, the the sight of this bubble being burst a little bit, it seems like there could be a saving grace, just a bright side to it. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to move on to to another question, which is something that's probably on a lot of a lot of people's minds, and something that has been addressed in other forums extensively. But um, uh, why? So why did? Uh, just this this question of like are the are the M, is the MPP and the DPP do they really not have different platforms um, if if so do, if they don't then why did the MPP win in such a landslide this year is the question essentially <laughs> Judith. Well, I, I think, as I said in my presentation, I think that uh, I think that people are actually actually tired of um, uh, uh, of uncertainty, uh, what they see as disorganisation, and um, and and uh, really really would like to return to something more more of a quiet life. My, uh, Mongolian friends have uh, said said so so much to to me. Um, what I did find find very interesting was, was all the talk about uh, uh, about gaining the youth vote. Uh, in the end, was really like a popped balloon. Nothing uh, nothing uh, appears to nothing appears to have come uh, have come for it. The the young uh, the the youngest uh, group of age group of voters just uh, just uh, do not appear to have turned turned out. Maybe they didn't like the rain, uh, but no, I think that. Um, or it was an Instagram opportunity to to take a picture near Dell and post yeah, it on yeah. social media. Yeah, I mean there was, there was uh, somebody somebody commented on one of the news sites recently that 
that uh, that the the MPP was uh, really really going back to its its old traditions of, um, of of this being a big a big party. Glitzy was the word that was that was uh, used about their camp uh, their, about their cam campaigns. Um, but I, I, I do I do think that. Uh, uh, more, uh, the Mongolian electorate actually actually wants a little bit more certainty uh, about their about their future. I think I'd agree with that, and and um, and also the the certainty uh, was on offer from the MPP largely from its claims mm -hmm. to being relatively good at managing things, and they mm -hmm. had two big issues to point to. Um, you know, some success combating air pop air uh, air. Um, pollution in Ulaanbaatar uh, and also the response to COVID, um, which, which has mm -hmm. arguably been quite successful. Um, now, whether the MPP had anything to do with the success of those, <laughs> of those responses is a whole nother question, right? But it was, I think it was an argument um, along with, with what Judith had just said about uh, a desire for, or maybe a sense of wariness about change and a desire for some certainty uh, coupled with uh, with some claims as success um, made for a, a powerful mix towards the electorate. Uh, I, I can't think of a single party uh, or past presidential candidate having been elected for the strength of his or her party platform. Um, that is, I don't think any of those election victories have come out of broad public agreement with a particular aspect of a platform where a policy difference was apparent from other candidates. Mm. Definitely. I think the sense of so much uncertainty played probably the crucial and the determining role in terms of, uh, because if you look at the pre uh, dynamics of previous elections, uh, there is um, um, certain proclivity for the Mongolian people to select the, the opposite party, but it did happen this time. And uh, another thing is probably uh, also uh, the guilty party could be the Democratic Party itself because of their inability to just uh, sustain and form any type of coherent vision uh, or any type, type of uh, uh, coherency probably in their policies. So uh, who did well from the Democratic Party were some former uh, governors from Amex which was a very interesting uh, development. Uh, we were expecting probably some veterans from the Democratic Party could have some seats, but it didn't happen. So it, it remains to be seen what the local dynamics could play a role in future elections, not only parliamentary, but local. Mm. Yeah, um, I was just noticing earlier that um, ICON had a had an interview with uh, Tsotkerel, who is the head of the Teso Corporation, right? Which is a fairly important conglomerate in Mongolia right now, but he's also from UFS. And the interview actually centered around like the issue of rural politics. And um, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm gonna ask one final question because we're, we're already, I think a little bit over our planned time limit. Um, thanks everyone for asking your questions and for all of your engagement. Um, I'm definitely going to go back and read through the chat and uh, there were a lot of, there was some good discussion going on in the chat box as well. Um, yeah, so so the final question, um, someone had asked uh, if, if there was a relation between party platforms and foreign policy, um, we could maybe also just enlarge that to be a question about foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Gosh, hmm. Judith, go ahead. <laughs> ah, well, foreign pol foreign policy is is the one thing that doesn't seem to change too much in in uh, in Mongolia. Again, because uh, Mongolia uh, needs uh, uh, now uh, needs the needs the help of outside countries. They need. Um, I, I still think that there's um, there, there's an importance in the in the idea of, of a th of um, <clears throat> a third uh, of a third neighbour, uh, but what we're seeing what we're seeing at the moment, I think, is. Um, is not so much is not so much uh, a lot of uh, a lot of anti-Chinese rhetoric, but also uh, but some uh, uh, 
getting getting closer to getting closer to uh, to Russia, and I think that uh, I think that that relationship is going to is going to be uh, fairly important in the next in the next few years. Um, but I think that Mongolia is still very conscious of um, uh, of its re really its overriding overriding wish uh, to be seen as an as an independent country. Uh, somebody somebody put a comment on uh, uh, on the on the comment list uh, uh, suggesting that suggesting that um, uh, um, economically economic strength is really is really going to uh, going to be um, uh, of, of great importance to to strengthening Mongolia's uh, in independence. I don't think it's going to be easy, um, uh, and it would be very interesting to see what uh, what happens over over things like pipelines and uh, and belt and, and belt and road and so on. And the S and the SCO. I think these questions are going to come up uh, quite uh, quite soon. Sanju, you want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, if, we, if we guys remember, uh, I did a piece with uh, Connor from SOAS uh, at your blog about the relationship between the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Belt and Road Initiative. So the original question was how Mongolian party politics shapes the foreign policy, right? I think there are so many different vectors to explore there and I'm not an expert in there. There are sometimes so many random things that depend on quick some sort of individuals or certain cliques or certain factions that we just are not able to trace where that they came from. And then there are certain uh, policies that are a little bit more bottom up that end up sometimes uh, being lobbied and through certain individuals, be it members of parliament or ministers, etc. So in terms of the um, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I feel there are certain developments that are a little bit concerning right now, uh, because the, as I said in my argument, uh, at Julian's blog, that the, Belt and Road Initiative is such a um, fluid uh, and fluid system as well, fluid idea that uh, many initiatives that uh, can be incorporated uh, from bottom up. It's not a grand strategy that certain Western commentators are talking about, but it's sometimes it's more of a bottom up system where the Chinese diaspora or even in Mongolians in inner Mongolia and their connections within Mongolia and their interests, especially in the extractive sector in Mongolia can in certain aspects shape from where the certain project mineral project gets financed, uh, who gets to do that, which parties to get to uh, do the certain parts, where does it get uh, financed, how any grievance or conflict mechanisms get uh, resolution at which court, etc. So there are certain developments that are being con concerning. And especially when uh, looking at the fact that Belt and Road and the Chinese Communist, Communist Party is um, kind of shaping up and trying to uh, substantiate the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, juxtaposing it to Western uh, development interventions, saying that we do not require conditionalities such as an IMF or World Bank. We are extremely um, attuned to local interests, local party politics, etc. So in that sense, there, is a, uh, there are certain precedents that Chinese uh, overseas investment gets uh, get done pretty quickly, uh, but it's not up to standards to certain um, Western standards, environmental, social, etc., regarding certain projects. And if you look at uh, Belt and Road Initiative's uh, influence and certain isomorphism to Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union at its initiatives, it's a little bit also disconcerting 
and especially regarding the current uh, initiatives about the pipeline and its potential geopolitical, environmental, so and social ramifications. How those can be, uh, for me, it seems like it, it, will be, it will be a little bit too much for Mongolian current governance and framework, both in its capacity as, and as well as in its conflict management. And it's and in general in, in balance of Mongolian politics. So that's just a little bit disconcerting regarding Mongolia's foreign policy. Lots of important things both Judith and Sanchez said there. The the one piece I might add is um I mean one of the links where um party politics sort of did interact with um, or could conceivably interact more with international relations at the moment is around democracy, right? And the uh, Democratic Party has really over the last couple of years given up its claim to being a, sort of an agent and a, a champion and advancing democracy. Um, for whatever faults he had, um, Eric Dodge as a president uh, made I find at least some pretty credible efforts to deepen democracy and to introduce some elements of uh, of more participatory um, processes and the like. Uh, and we see very little of that left. And then uh, obviously the current president seems to have no interest in that um, as far as I can tell. Uh, and also in this recent parliamentary campaign, I don't think the DP any longer really made a very credible claim to say, look, we are the, continue, the, the champion of a continued democratization. And where that links to um, international relations is, is precisely as, as Sanchez and as Judith both, both noted, <laughs> the two neighbors as, as always loom large, um, n both of which look ugly uh, when you think about democracy. Um, and so to the extent that, that democracy is a, a strong link, has been in the past for Mongolia to various partners, uh, so-called third neighbors, um, that link I think is weakening and, uh, and it's uh, despite the consensus that Judith also talked about that this is really something that seems to stay fairly stable, the, the third neighbor concept, despite that consensus, um, I do think those relationships are weakening in, in several different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you have uh, another response back, Judith? Uh, no, no, I was just trying to reply to someone who sent me oh, a, okay. a, a private message. <laughs> yes, yes, sorry about that. No problem. Uh, no, no, I, I mean, I think that, uh, I, I think that uh, the comments of, of, of our other two speakers have, uh, have, been, um, uh, have been very, very, very clear and uh, interesting in opening, in opening the the, uh, the 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 whole the whole questions that we've been looking at. Uh, I think that uh, I think that Mongolia Mongolian politics are extra, uh, extremely extremely complex, and uh, and that uh, the, uh, the the leaders are having to hold lots of ball, keep lots of balls in the air at at uh, at, at one time. Um, something somebody uh, somebody did comment on, on I think it was uh, I think it was Julian but somebody else may, may have said said something about it um, the country the country versus the town um, it, it, I think I, I think that the um, uh, I'm getting, getting going around in circles now um, uh, I, I think I, I think that it, it is actually rather difficult to see uh, you know unless you're on the ground to see to see um, the dynamics between the two between the two parts the uh, if you look at the if you look at the press and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, political comments um, it's all it's all really really um, uh, uh, centered and I think that there is a there is a, a a bigger, a bigger story outside that, um, that takes in takes in uh, the countryside. Where is it going to go? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. All right. Well, on that note, I think we're going to call it uh, a successful event. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for for attending, and we're looking forward to putting this up on our YouTube channel soon. Um, we have another virtual speaker panel planned, um, organized. So if, if you want to mark your calendars, um, it will be um, September 17th for those in the US and Friday, September 18th for those in Ulaanbaatar and I believe also the UK. I'm not sure what, what that, where that fits European time, but we will include that in, in our announcement. 
Um, Sorry, don't ask me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Anyway, it will be either September 17th or, or September 18th, depending on where you are on the globe. Um, and our next event is going to be with, um, I think we actually have four or five panelists confirmed, and they are uh, field, field research, um, uh, more sort of hard science people. So we have uh, biologists and um, archaeologists, um, and they will be, they all work in sort of the Hoove School area. So that also kind of gets us a little bit more to the countryside as well. Um, so that's what our next event is going to be. Um, so we're really looking forward to that.